Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lexi Neely, and I'm the program coordinator at Little Free Library. And this is Little Free Library Unbound. It's our monthly webinar series. Um, we gather stewards, authors, and other great book people to talk about um, book things and sharing books and book access. So if you are someone who shows up every month to hang out with us, or if you're brand new here, thank you for taking the time. Um, today we're talking all about Little Free Library stewardship. And you may be wondering, what is a steward? And a steward is the individual or a group that cares for a Little Free Library. The basic responsibilities of a Little Free Library steward include keeping it stocked with books and keeping up regular maintenance like painting um, to keep the library in good condition so the community can use it for a long time. Many stewards host read-alouds and other activities with their Little Free Library patrons or visitors, while others remain hands-off. The steward experience is unique for everyone, so today we'll be talking with some stewards about their Little Free Library journeys, and you can learn a little bit more about uh, the many different ways of having a Little Free Library and being a steward. So I've got some polls today, so let's pull that up, and I will launch those. So the first one is, um, which best describes you? Are you a Little Free Library steward with your own Little Free Library? Are you a user or patron who regularly uses Little Free Libraries? Um, or are you just a Little Free Library supporter? You're a fan and you're just here to check out what we have going on. The second question is one for the stewards. How long have you been a steward? Less than a year, one to three years, four or more years? And the last question is for those of you who are not stewards. So are you just beginning to learn about Little Free Library? Are you seeking information for questions or concerns you have about starting a library? And are you ready to start your own? Or you're not really interested in starting your own, but you're here to learn a little bit more just, just for fun. It looks like all of them are required questions, which is my bad. I apologize for that. but we're getting some interesting responses. We have a lot of stewards here and a lot of people supporting the organization and the movement and interested in learning more and a lot of new stewards. So it is really exciting to be able to bring you into the fold, give you some new ideas um, and boost your confidence as a steward because the first year can be tricky. There's lots of challenges and learning curves, but there are also lots of different um, triumphs and small wins and different ideas that may give you some some thoughts about what you might be able to do differently. All right, thank you. And check out the results there. Next, I am going to play a quick video that one of our wonderful summer interns, Melody, put together. It's a great primer for anyone just getting acquainted with Little Free Library and the benefits of stewardship. Special shout out to Melody, our intern, for putting together that great video. Hopefully that gave you a little taste of what it's like to be a Little Free Library steward and what's in store if you're getting started on your journey. 
Now I would like to hand things off to Anita, who is our national board chair. She is our regular Little Free Library Unbound moderator, and she is always lots of fun. So Anita, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Lexi. And thank you, Melody, for that really fun and uh, exciting video. It's going to be sharing that a lot. Um, I just want to welcome all of you to Chapter 9 of Little Free Library Unbound. I want to thank Margaret uh, Bernstein, who was our wonderful board member who took over and had that wonderful chat with the authors who have Little Free Libraries uh, last month. And so that was really a lot of fun and exciting. And I'm so thrilled again to be hosting and talking to your, you know, to one of you or three or four of you. So all of the stewards are doing so many wonderful things and we are so proud. We're, we're excited to have you be part of this. Also happy Hispanic Heritage Month. This month, uh, Little Free Library Unbound, uh, it, their giveaway is gonna highlight a beloved book by one of my favorite Hispanic authors, so stay tuned and find out what it, who it is and what the details are for getting that book. We're going to have another wonderful steward panel so you can learn more about how to maximize your experiences as a little free library steward, learn from them, get some inspiration by all the wonderful things that they're doing as part of uh, starting a library of your own. So we will start with um, Christine Dowen who is in St. Petersburg, Florida, a steward since 2020. She has one little free library, one little free library among a network of 236 and growing. So I'll have Christine just say a little bit about your little free library and I'll just introduce each of you, each of those panelists as we go. So take it away, Christine. So even though I only have one library, I have 260 stewards to help me manage over 200, over 300 wow. in St. Petersburg. So at the beginning of COVID, I found myself in need of a project. We were all stuck in quarantine and I was out of books. And so I threw a, a China hutch at the end of my driveway and I had 20 to 30 people stopping a day. And it was really cool because they just came up to the China Hutch, threw whatever, took whatever, and off they went. And it, in a time when you're literally supposed to stay away from everybody and there is just no way to make that connection, it was just nice to be able to sit on our porch and see these people coming and going and just knowing that we are having a little bit more of a sense of community even in the middle of, well, in the beginning of a global pandemic. So my husband did not love our China hutch. It uh, actually went out by the way of bulk trash pickup. It was in really rough shape when we got rid of it. And we now have a phone booth and a newsstand next to it. Uh, we found the phone booth on Craigslist, like, like all good things. And uh, I decided I wanted a dedicated children's library. So my husband thought a newsstand would be a nice compliment. And I went to the Tampa Bay Times. They are they have now closed their factory, but they were happy to give me three newsstands. I took one for myself. I took two more and I posted them on my Buy Nothing group. And I said, hey, does anybody want a little free library in their front yard? Well, two became six, which became 40, which is now... 236 newsstands wow. in 207 locations. We range all the way, um, all the way up through Palm Harbor, all the way through Tampa Bay. Uh, we have so we have brought over 100,000 used books to the community completely for free. Uh, I've made a, an amazing network of people who. They are so willing and giving, and it's just such an honor. Um, so the pictures that we have shown, uh, the first one is me and my husband and my dog. We're at our little library. That's, that's our library. And uh, the second picture is a bunch of newsstands lined up in my driveway. Uh, so I scraped them, cleaned them, changed plexiglass, attached charters, got them all ready to go. Uh, I had lots of people who kind of came in and out from our steward group. At the beginning, it was just me and my husband. He was not having it. So at 27, <laughs> he was done. Um, so I had, but I had stewards who were happy to come in and help. And 
Um, so it made a huge difference just being a part of the community and, and building this up. And so those, those are just all prepped, ready to go and ready to be delivered. Oh, thank you so much, Christine. That, that is simply amazing. And it's, it's, we expect no less. All of you are just so creative in what you do to bring your own book joy to communities here and, and, far, and near and far. So thank you so much. Our other uh, next steward is Lisa Lopez. She is in El Paso, or she has been in El Paso, Texas. I think, Lisa, you're in a different location now. But she's been a steward since 2010, 155 plus Little Fee Libraries. She also has a very, very special connection to Little Fee Library and its history. So, Lisa, welcome, and it's so good to see you. So, let us, why don't you tell your story, and uh, we'll do questions with everybody at the end. But let's hear your story. It's very special. Sure. Um, so yes, this was in 2010, basically when the nonprofit Little Free Library started. And I had the pleasure of talking to Todd Bull since day one. I sent an email through the website. He called me right away. He says, you're in the border. Um, that's a perfect place to um, multiply these free book exchanges. And I said that I, it would be my honor to help you out with this. And he entrusted in me a whole lot. And he would um, give me a whole bunch of the charter signs back then. Back in 2010, they were made out of solid wood, beautiful yeah. ones. He also donated a couple of actual little free libraries that he would ship over to El Paso. And I was able to donate. Um, once, uh, one went to the hospital, uh, the children's hospital. Another went to the university, UTEP, um, um, in El Paso, Texas. And um, it was just amazing how quickly... Uh, the community embraced the whole concept just because El Paso has been known as one of the least literate cities in the nation. It gets ranked that, unfortunately, uh, year after year. So um, I figured it would be the great a great opportunity to get many um, organizations, schools, institutions, even the Woodworkers Club of El Paso, which built nearly 100 out of the 155 uh, for the community all across across um, the U.S.-Mexico border in El Paso and to the Juarez. Uh, but Todd was instrumental. May he rest in peace. He is missed terribly. Um, we used to have conversations and share ideas. He's very generous and just a marvelous person. He's missed a lot. Um, and I know um, over the years, I mean, it's been a while since 2010. I know um, the Little Free Library book, I they do mention my story um, on here. And of course, Margaret Aldrich did an amazing job, um, you know, promoting a whole bunch of us stewards that were, you know, since back then. And also Miranda Paul, the children's author also mentions my story here in the Little Library's Big Heroes uh, picture book, which is amazing because as a librarian, I get to share this with um, the schools where I've been a librarian at. Right now, I'm in Albuquerque, and students really enjoy the whole concept of having a little free library. We're actually in the process of installing one outside of our campus. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. And there's there's so much more that... Uh, that's being done. Uh, we're at Little Free Library. We're, we're having conversations with, with Reforma, uh, yes. the librarians group, and to expand more and help along the border and in other places. And um, I just want to thank you and all your all the stewards for the work that you do. Next on introduction is Kristen Monroe, who is in Poway, California, a steward since 2020. She has one really beautiful Little Free Library. I have a friend in Poway, so. Um, this is really exciting. So tell us about yours, Kristen, and your path. Thank you so much, Anita. I hope when you come to visit your friend that you'll stop by uh, the Monroe family's Purple Blossom Little Free Library. Our story actually started when our younger daughter was two years old. We moved to Poway because it had the best school districts here in the San Diego area. And when it was time for her to start kindergarten, we had two schools that we could pick from. And the school that we ended up choosing was a Spanish immersion dual language um, school, but it was a Title I school. And so one of the first things I did when we joined that school was to uh, join the foundation, which is the fundraising arm of the school. And in that population, 
those students needed help with things like school supplies and technology and access to books that they didn't have in their own homes. And so one of my first tasks was to help raise $15,000 to purchase um, brand new English and Spanish books for our school library because there were so many students who at home just didn't have the same access that other students had. And that really stuck with me. So fast forward to 2020 when the um, pandemic first started and we realized that those schools and those libraries were closed. Uh, my family decided it was time to launch this library and offer um, books to those students. We still live in the same house. Um, my daughter is now a sophomore in college. My younger daughter, who is also my fellow um, assistant steward, is a junior in high school, but we still live in that same house. Our neighborhood still services that same school, and the children in our neighborhood um, still need that same access. And so when the pandemic hit, it was important for us to start our library. Thank you so much, Krista. And that whole issue of access two books, but particularly books that reflect our voices, our stories, our languages is so critical. So, and I, I you know, offline, I'm going to have a source for you because in speaking to Patrick Sullivan from the Reforma, he was talking about a, a garage full of books that we said we would be promised to connect him with stewards like yourself. So, uh, so get ready. <laughs> and last but not least is our wonderful Yenny Young, who has been, she's a steward in Clarkston, Georgia. She's been a steward since 2020. She has two little free libraries and a wonderful nonprofit she created, readforunity.com. Yenny, thank you so much. We know that you're also uh, now doing some work and going to grad school in Georgetown and Washington, D.C. So, um, let's hear you because I, I was so pleased. We connected, I think it was by Facebook, right? When I found That's, out. Uh, yeah, by Instagram. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I found out what you were doing, this is how I find so many of you wonderful stewards. I, I troll the Instagram and hear right. everybody's stories. So tell us about you. Yeah, and I'm your so libraries. glad you found us, Anita. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Yeah, just real quickly, our story kind of started. Um, in terms of um, us being, uh, you know, a steward of Little Free Library, uh, the Little Free Library is actually part of our grassroots nonprofit, Read for Unity, that I started with my friend Sarah at the, on the top right of the picture. Uh, we both came from Indonesia. Um, uh, our, our love for, while we only started this uh, grassroots nonprofit last year during the height of the pandemic, uh, like many others, um, our story actually kind of started a while back. I mean, we came here, as, uh, you know, as refugees and, um, you know, as a teenager, I, I, you know, I was an English learner, beginner's English learner. So I actually picked up uh, fourth, fifth, sixth grade uh, chapter books for me to kind of learn English, et cetera. I also, you know, obviously the first thing that I noticed uh, startlingly was uh, that there's no, not one book at that particular time that represents, you know, um, me, my my story, or or you know, uh, even uh, any representations, you know, uh, for me and my community. Um, and also, fast forward a little bit after college, I was actually uh, volunteering heavily as a mentor to um, um, youngsters, basically students between first and fifth grade, in an area that is uh, very much a book desert, uh, Title One schools, etc., predominantly African American. And all those students who are extremely bright, you know, uh, just um, hungry to, to, to learn, et cetera, they, uh, again, I could not find them books that represent who they are. So, um, and so, so I keep that passion in mind to, to, to kind of just play my own little small part. When I find out about Little Free Library, actually, I, I saw the first one in Boston, of all places. Uh, in around 2016 or so, I was telling Sarah, I was like, oh my gosh, this thing is, <laughs> I didn't realize, I thought this was just a one project by one person in the neighborhood. And then I found out about littlefreelibrary.org and I just like, wow, you know. So um, again, fast forward in, into the height of the pandemic, Sarah and I decided, you know what, instead of keep putting ourselves, like putting all the plans in, back into the drawing board, we're just gonna start rallying our family and friends and neighbors um, you know, from near and far to help us, uh, you know, raise money for brand new 
uh, K to eight, um, you know, diverse books strictly by BIPOC authors and uh, distributed in existing official little free libraries around Metro Atlanta. Some uh, we specifically um, set aside uh, to create both windows and mirrors, um, which means that, you know, uh, in the book desert area, we want to create that, uh, you know, mirror effect so that all the books, uh, you know, can really represent the kids, um, you know, uh, the scholars there. And uh, in the suburb where I live, for example, uh, we wanted to create that uh, windows effects where uh, kids, you know, uh, there can finally see, oh, you know what, uh, folks who don't look like me also have the same dreams, aspirations, talents, etc. And for the past year, barely one year, we've been donating over 2,500 um, brand new books, uh, diverse books. Uh, again, our focus is uh, from K to middle schoolish, and then uh, all over Metro Atlanta and beyond. We actually also provide uh, ability for teachers to um, to request books through our uh, website, and uh, we have two of our own little free libraries installed at Refuge Coffee, which is at the most uh, epicenter of the most diverse square mile in America. And since for that past year, since the pandemic, where like Christian mentioned earlier, our schools closed, libraries closed, our two little libraries have been um, visited time and time again. We've been replenishing books basically every two to three weeks constantly uh, ever since. So uh, we're so grateful for the opportunity and we, we're really grateful for the support from uh, Team Little Free Library. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And and you're right. This is the way that, you know, people who don't see themselves in books, they see themselves. Um, thank you for to both Kristen and Lisa for explaining what a Title I school is in the chat. You can see that a right. Title I school, it's determined by number of students receiving free or reduced lunches. Mm -hmm. That's often a determinant for things like um, book giveaways for Book First Book, for example, which does great book donations to high needs uh, communities. Um, so I wanted to, uh, let's start with questions because we've got you all uh, and I know that we will have questions from this, the, those who are listening, um, but we'll start with our, our next question, which is, how do I choose a great location for a little free library? And this is for Christine and Yenny. We've got you already geared up for that question, but, um, you know, I'll start with you, Christine, and then uh, Yenny, after that, how did you, how do you, why choose a great location for a little free library? So the biggest thing that I always look for is a steward who is dedicated to the library. That is my number one. And every single library that I've placed, every single one of the 207 locations has had a dedicated steward who is excited and enthusiastic about the mission to spread books, to share books, who wants to be invested in taking care of the library. and. They may not be the most well-traveled spaces. They may not be the prettiest or the most in need spaces, but they will be the best taken care of spaces because there's a steward who genuinely cares and wants the library to succeed. Um, well-trafficked, obviously a bonus. Uh, a steward who can check on it regularly uh, once a week, that's a huge bonus, yeah. uh, but when you look at actual ways to drive traffic, you can share Facebook, Instagram, flyers, uh, all sorts of things that our stewards have done that are creative ways to get people involved and get people coming to the library. So if you make the library a destination, the people will come. And one of the ways to do that is, of course, keeping a high quality uh, selection of books, like books that are in good condition, that are more current, that people want to read. Great. And Yenny, I, I think you were uh, going to answer that question as well. Absolutely. I, I absolutely agree with all um, the points that Christine made earlier. And just to build on that, um, especially specifically for our purposes, for example, since our little free library is kind of uh, wrapped into our small organization, for us, you know, while choosing the right location is definitely relative, right, for each steward. For us specifically, we knew, you know, that we wanted to install our little free library units um, 
in a location where it's already an established community organization, which is why, uh, you know, um, we chose, you know, uh, carefully our partner where we are installing uh, the Little Free Library because those partners will be our close to work. Uh, you know, and they're the one who's going to be helping us to be our eyes and ears on a weekly basis, like Christine said earlier, um, so that we can uh, make sure to replenish them uh, properly uh, with current reads, etc. So, uh, you know, we and and again, choosing for us, you know, uh, because we are we are trying to create a free little diverse libraries, for example, uh, that community connection is important. So like Refuge Coffee we chose because it is in the most diverse community in America with over 60 nationalities and languages spoken. Uh, but the place itself are also, uh, the place itself is considered book desert, you know, from the uh, numbers of Title I schools, et cetera. Um, and it is a high traffic area because it, it happens to be a coffee house and it has a nice uh, outdoor area where our, our little uh, hand-painted little free library stood out. Um, and um, we want that, we want our, you know, little library, like uh, you said earlier, to be that destination for immediate exposure and access, you know, for that community. Um, so um, let me see. And also, I think uh, our advice too that, you know, to find a location that, again, conveys our why, you know, uh, you know, our mission and vision. And I think that's also equally as important because your passion as a steward uh, and more importantly, involving your tribe uh, will make it successful. I mean, we, we've, we've seen it from what Kristen has done in the, uh, St. Pete, right? Yeah, and I think that's critical when, uh, you know, very often it, it's a project by an uh, Eagle Scout troop or a group of students. Right. And, and sometimes those aren't as maintained because the student has graduated. And so you want to always try to expand and, you know, keep a, a good network of people who can check on those libraries as well. And then we've got the great stewards who are, they're always guardians of additional uh, and adopters of additional Little Free Libraries. Um, Kristen and Lisa, if you have anything to add on uh, finding a great location, both of you also are instrumental in uh, you know, serving communities. Any other tips from you? You know, I'm lucky in the city of Poway, we have uh, 20 local little free libraries. Most of them are in front of homes, but we also have some in parks and in schools. And I just think it's a matter of placing them where people go and where people are living their lives. Um, and so I really think if you keep that in mind, you can't go wrong. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. And we have a question for you, Lisa. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to mention real quick. Um, schools are ideal. I've always been mm -hmm. an elementary school librarian, and there's always that, you know, a set group of students that love the library and that are just the perfect stewards, really. And um, so it's, it's fascinating to see how good they monitor it and how they remind each other how it needs to be used. If you take one, bring one, you know, if you take them all, we're going to be left without any books. So <laughs> it's our, yeah, they're, they're um, very creative and very caring with each other when it comes to having a little free library that has, that gives them that sense of ownership. And that's why mm -hmm. um, I've always um, encouraged um, schools to have a design contest where mm -hmm. students get to participate and how they wish to see their little free library colored or painted. Um, and that really does enhance that sense of community and, and ownership okay. too. And you can partner an elementary school with a junior high or high schools uh, to actually have that, you know, community or have that, uh, that project. So, Absolutely. you know, a high school or a junior high school can build or can decorate one alongside the elementary school students as well. And uh, one of my favorite Read Across America events, this is before Little Free Library, but the, when we would do reading events, the junior high school band when the kids came and visited the one auditorium where there was a reading event, the bands just came and lined the sidewalks for the kids coming. It was just a festive thing. And so having your uh, local schools be involved in the ribbon cutting and things like that, it becomes really 
just a whole community affair. Um, we have a question for you, Lisa, and, and this is always complicated and challenging for people who are having to navigate city zoning laws or HOAs, for example, you know, and, and trying also to, uh, to deal with questions where the HOA says, well, this is taken away from the public library, or this is, you know, we have questions or that or concerns. Um, how, how, what's the advice that you would give to uh, prospective stewards or current stewards who are having to navigate that complicated landscape? Well, I know um, installing them at city parks, it took off pretty quickly. When, they, when um, the city realized that schools were adopting these free books exchanges, they were quick to say, hey, well, maybe at city parks. And I thought, yes, why not? So I went ahead and put some slides together and um, they gave me an appointment uh, through the uh, Parks and Recreation Department uh, because they're in charge of the city parks back in El Paso, Texas. Um, and they allowed me oh, to Lisa, speak for- lost sound. Oh. Maybe it's me. Can you all hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, so I, I went ahead and um, made a presentation for the for the board of uh, the Parks and Recreation Department, and um, they were pretty impressed. And mm -hmm. of course, just the fact- Oh, you can hear. Oh, I can't. I'm sorry. Hold on. Oh, no. Oh, no. I lost sound. I wanted to have the liability. Yeah. Liability is always an issue. Um, here in Albuquerque, I haven't even had to, I haven't had the pleasure of really promoting the Little Free Libraries as much because you see them everywhere. Albuquerque has really adopted this initiative much more strongly than back in El Paso, Texas. Um, so I haven't had to do a lot of the advocacy type of work that I did back home. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I um, what I remember clearly, the board approved having Little Free Libraries at city parks with the condition that there had to be an active neighborhood association. If that city park did not have an active neighborhood association, they were not going to mess installing a Little Free Library. So that was the one thing, the one condition that they said, yes, let's proceed installing them at parks, but the neighbors really have to be involved that if it gets vandalized, if, it, if, you know, if there's inappropriate content or trash, that the neighbors will be the ones taking care of it. And um, that worked out really well um, over the years. And in terms of HOAs, I mean, that's typically residentials and they have all these bylaws um, that are very, very strict. So I haven't really had um, the, uh, the opportunity to really work with a, a, a neighborhood association or that has HOAs in place that um, won't permit the installation of these structures. But I think it's all in the bylaws. If the bylaws say no uh, standing structures outside of the facilities, then it's really hard to forego that. And perhaps um, starting a little free library inside an indoor one might work best. But I know wherever there's HOAs, it's really tough. It's tough because they're they're pretty firm. We've definitely had that as well. So it's not possible to go 207 locations without your share of challenges. And schools have been really great. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've installed, I think, at 11 or 12 of them now. But there are some schools that they're like, we don't want to have it. We're, and some, they said, we're quarantining all books. Don't, yeah. don't even think about it. Like, we're not touching that with a 10-foot pole. And it's funny because, like, the three schools surrounding them all are ecstatic. And we're, like, setting up a, a nice library for them. And they're just, so it's, it's just, you have to know someone within the school. And you have to be willing to talk to them and willing to work with them. And, like, there's a location that I've been trying to get a set of little free libraries it's definitely a title one it's one of the government assistance areas they could really use this and really benefit from it it's been six or seven months now and i've been going back and forth and back and forth trying just trying to communicate to them all the benefits and and it just takes time ever since COVID started i think um the initiative has taken a hold uh, the, the, there's been a pause, I think, from, uh, with the weariness that, you know, transmission of the virus through book exchanges. Um, but I think now that it's been 
almost two years, I think um, we're beginning to say, okay, you know what, let's continue, let's continue to push forward, um, you know, just hand sanitizer, at least in schools. I mean, that's basically what, yeah. I'm jumping in for Anita here. She's having some sound issues, but this is all really great advice. Um, and I will say in my role, I kind of manage steward services, which means I hear from a lot of stewards about the different challenges you run into. Um, and the, the biggest thing, I think the best advice that I can give is just to be nimble. I think a lot of folks are excited and they, they purchase or build their library um, and then it, it comes time to install it and they run into and that feels blow. Um, it's really frustrating. Um, it can be really discouraging. And like Lisa mentioned, some of the HOAs just have really strict rules. Um, but, you know, if it's not in the cards, if the HOA is not receptive, um, if you can't rally your neighbors to support you in, in appealing to the HOA, consider other options. Um, as Kristen mentioned, you know, high, high traffic places um, that see a lot of foot traffic, maybe it's the post office or the grocery store or a barber shop or salon. Those make really great locations um, for little free libraries because they're places that people go throughout their day. Um, it does involve, you have to go a little further than looking out the front door to check on it, which isn't accessible for everyone. Um, but you may find a local business such as a coffee shop or something like that that's really interested in the initiative and is excited about being partners on it. So, you know, having it at home on your property is ideal for some people, but in cases where it doesn't work out, being nimble, kind of remembering, okay, I want to do this. This is why I want to do this. How can I navigate this um, is really it'll help you push past that frustration and find a solution that is equally as impactful for your community. I'm gonna get us started um, on the next question. And I believe Anita is back. And I'm back. <laughs> she can hear, so we are all set. Anita, I'll let you, I'll let you okay. take the next one and comment on the HOA stuff if you have any other additional notes. Yeah, um, there, I, I know that there was a steward who navigated the HOA by making her Little Free Library more mobile. So it was more of a pot that she could move. Um, and so it wasn't a permanent structure on the site so that the HOA was had fewer issues with that. Um, I do, I'm a big fan of barbershops, salons, laundromats are also great, great places for Little Free Libraries. Um, and, and look around at local businesses. You know, supermarkets, they do a lot with local schools too. So that's also another place or the little the little markets, you know, some of the places have these little mom and pop kind of markets. When I lived in D.C., there were all these little Ethiopian markets and Latino markets that were nearby and, and talk about a need for um, some books and some book love. That would be great. Um, our next question is I think a lot of us have dealt with this, and that is how do I get or start or build a little free library on a limited budget? You know, we count pennies. We try to figure out how to get books. Um, so let's start with you, Christine. How do you start a library on a, on a limited budget and, and all the budget challenges that come with that? So I did mention, but my little free library started as a China Hutch. I got it for free. And the phone booth was not free, but the newsstand was free. And all the newsstands I've been able to place, those have all been free. Uh, so sometimes it's just getting creative. Uh, my favorite is actually furniture that's mounted on a post. So like they'll go, someone will go thrift shopping and find this perfect nightstand that has a door and it's all ready to go and they literally just have to drill in a, a latch to keep it closed and then it's mounted on the post and they paint it and it's like the coolest thing because they paid five bucks for the, the thing at the thrift shop and it looks like a million bucks like it looks even just it just looks so nice and especially when it's like old wood kind of stuff like really vintage kind of stuff and you just paint it and you can really give it a new life uh, so a craigslist buy nothing all your thrift stores next door think of bins think of cabinets uh, think of filing cabinets kitchen cabinets benches uh, if you have a space where you just want to put 
like if you already have a library and you just want to put more books out, one of the things you can do is just fill up a little plastic tub with the top and just put the tub out for the weekend. We've done that a lot in our areas, especially when we do scavenger hunts, and those go over really well because then the kids are on the, especially for kids' books, right, because kids are just digging through everything anyway, so yeah. they, don't, they don't need it <laughs> assembled nicely. <laughs> Uh, the yeah, big thing. Go ahead, oh, go ahead Kristen. Kristen. I think the big thing, though, is when you look at books and getting books on a budget. So, because it's it's all well and good to put up a little library, but if there's nothing ever in it, then it's not going to generate that interest. So, um, asking neighbors, going on next door, uh, asking in your communities if you have like a Facebook or an HOA type of community. Uh, what we actually did was we partnered with used bookstores and we brought books to them and we said, here, these books aren't moving. Um, they could be, you know, recipe, recipe books are hit and miss, cookbooks, diet books, uh, religious books, political books. All these books don't necessarily move in our libraries, but they will move from the bookstore. So we'll bring them just the pile of our books that aren't moving. And they'll just let me browse whatever and take whatever. And uh, that was, of course, after, you know, going back week after week after week. But uh, building up those partnerships. Another helpful thing that we did, now that we have so much scale, we actually partner with two different warehouses. And my, my truck bed of my F-150 will be full of books that aren't moving. I'll bring all of them. They'll just take all of them. It doesn't matter the condition, and it's so helpful for me. And then they'll let me take whatever we need for our book box. So I set up a book box on the side of my house, and we saw a picture of it earlier, but it's divided out by the board books, the leveled readers, adults, et cetera. And so I just keep it full. And our Facebook group, all 260 stewards have a free pass to just come to my house and take whatever books they need. I tell them, don't even ask me because there are five of you a day and I just go take your books and, and onward. <laughs> but that's been a huge help. Also mm -hmm. reaching out to publishers because publishers are so happy to send books. And I've been doing it in mass, but like Disney sent us 300 books to my house that I was able to pass out to all our libraries. And like we've reached out to local authors who have been happy to share books with us and we spotlight them on our Facebook page, which ultimately drives more traffic to the libraries because now we're advertising and they're sharing our stuff on their page. So it just, it all cycles. Right. Um, so we're, of course, this is always such a great topic and we keep doing it. And you, you touch upon storing excess books. Um, and, and so one of the other things that we wanted to do, because um, we need to keep going, is, um, you know, how often do you check on your library? Um, Kristen and Lisa, um, how do you do, how, what do you do and how do you, do you have a network of folks? Do you personally do? Um, some people also, um, you know, uh, drive around and check and see. Um, so Kristen and Lisa, let's have you tackle the, that question about checking on your libraries. I have to say when I first started, I was so excited. I probably checked it um, maybe once or twice a day just because it was so fun to go in and peek and see if there'd been any movement. Um, I've, I've backed off a little bit. So it's more like maybe um, two or three times a week. And then I will try to cycle everything out and put all fresh books out every two weeks. But there are those days, and my husband um, can attest, he's, he's in the group listening today, when I'll be sitting in our home office upstairs and I'll see him checking the mail, and I'll call and say, hey, how do the shelves look? Can you just straighten up the books? Can you kind of tell me if there's anything new? So there are some days where I just let it lie and if I catch him while he's checking the mail, maybe he'll take a peek. Um, it really does depend on your neighborhood. There are times when we have lots of families coming every single day, and then there might be a, a few days where we don't see anyone. Um, so I just kind of play it by ear, but uh, it's, it's one of the things I love the most to go out and check on it. Great. And Lisa, I'll have you, because um, I know we're getting close on time for you, <laughs> students are about to come streaming through. So if you haven't answered that question, and I have a question for Yenny. So um, go ahead, Lisa. 
Um, well, for me, obviously, I'm, I'm at school every day. It's the summertime where um, right now it's easy because I live in the neighborhood, so I can see how the Little Free Library is doing. But in the past, I would make sure weekly, um, I would drive by weekly to see if it had enough books, if it was, you know, taken care of. Like, I know our janitorial team, they, they're still there all summer long. Um, but when it's during the school year, it's, it's pretty easy for me to see how it's doing, you know, what does it need? Um, and also students, I mean, they were the ones that would tell me, hey, we're running low on books or, yeah. and first book is, you know, has been, uh, yeah, very, very um, generous. And we okay. always um, have been using first book uh, to uh, fill up our little free libraries. Yeah. And so I also want to echo publishers. Um, authors are great. Just I do have notes from a couple of authors that sometimes get a lot of requests and they have trouble, you know, just sort of managing their own <laughs> their own collection of books. So um, bear with them, um, you know, also support them because that's a great way to support uh, the authors as well. Um, Yenny, I actually have a question for you. And this is this pertains to to this about uh, publicizing and how do you get people to come to to your little free libraries? I've seen photos of an event at Refugee Coffee, Refuge Coffee. Um, how do you get that buzz? And whether it's press or whether it you know gets a lot of attention and community, um, you know, community love. And how do you how do you kind of engage the community? Absolutely. For us, again, we are so fortunate to have uh, one of the basically the best dream locations for our library, which makes it so much easier to get the community engaged because while we were, uh, you know, we are still a very micro organization with very limited uh, network, right, uh, at that, especially last September when we had our grand opening, like you mentioned, of our little free library. Um, be, but because our location was inside um, um, within Refuge Coffee um, perimeter where uh, we, we, we were able to actually leverage uh, Refuge Coffee's uh, vast audience and networks as well um, to really rally um, folks to come to this event. So uh, we decided to do a, a um, outdoor social distance, um, you know, limited attendance, um, uh, grand opening. Uh, I mean, again, you know, we what well, what we were able to do was uh, creatively was um, having um, the refugee artist actually uh, paint our library live during yeah. the grand opening. Uh, it took her four days later to finish it, but it generated so much interest. Uh, you know, when, when folks were coming in and then kind of seeing her, you know, paint our library right there. Uh, yeah. And then the grand opening was also supported by uh, several, you know, um, local donors and things like that that were willing to provide, you know, cookies and things like that. And then we donate to Refuge Coffee to provide, you know, drinks, uh, something very simple, uh, low budget, but uh, at the same time, we were able to, um, again, leverage this community organization um, who already has rosters of followers. Uh, yeah. Again, the power, don't discount the power of your own family, friends, and tribes, like I said, because mine came through yeah. in such a big way. Um, a lot of them, you know, just word of mouth is super powerful. And if, if they know your why and if they get behind your cause, uh, you know, uh, it can be a really powerful thing. Um, we did book giveaways uh, every now and then as well, like uh, that. Uh, again, we we wanted to honor teachers, especially from the Sido One schools, um, as much as possible by by donating a huge bundle to them. Um, you know, but again, because of funding, we we have many in waiting lists. So we ask our patrons, our potential donors, to support uh, us in this uh, Books for Heroes campaign. So having this Instagram hashtag campaigns for us have been working very well uh, because people are. Uh, more focused on and and it's very very clear as to why you wanted to raise uh, more books uh, for your real free libraries. You know, um, besides donating to teachers, you know, uh, these teachers are also exchanging books through our uh, little free library units uh, yeah. within that area. So we kind of we've been able to we've been lucky to be able to kind of combine all of these uh, networking uh, events. 
to make it work. And I actually have a couple of suggestions too. If you talk to your local schools and athletes, you know, students love to do little book talks. They may not be able to yes. read the whole book aloud because of publisher restrictions about that, mm -hmm. but having a fun little book talk and, you know, having them do an Instagram takeover, having exactly. athletes talk about it, you know, things like that. Or, or if you partner with a local store and you do a whole list of food related books, and Absolutely. then, you know, reach out to local parent groups and things like that. Just kind of continue to create really fun ideas. You know, it's yes. sports season. How do, how do people, you know, stay fit with uh, their reading as well as, as uh, fitness for sports? So right. have be creative. Look for all sorts of blogs and ways in which you do. talk to your local Agreed. reporters, news anchors, local mm -hmm. TV reporters. They love this stuff. The weatherman, Agreed. you know, or yeah. weather woman or weather person. They all love to talk about the, their fun things. So, yes, you know, we've been doing that local. Creative. a lot absolutely yeah. and, uh, and independent authors were great we've been doing a lot of uh they can do read aloud you know all you know because they're independent and they're unagented they're you know what i mean they're they're their own agent so we've been able our board member is actually a children's book author and she's been doing author talks on our behalf in various schools and venues mm -hmm. So I, Lexi, I, I want to check and see and how we're on time because I know we're getting really, really close to being actually over time. And I know Lisa has, uh, with students were coming about to ready to stream in. I, I just can't tell you how, how thrilled I am to talk to, these are my celebrities. So all, all of these stewards who are doing so many great things. Um, we are very, very excited to have you share your ideas. I know that one of the other questions, and unless they're going to uh, cut me off here, was um, one question people always have is about people emptying out your book bookshelves and how do you cope with that? Do you put stamps? And I know that's a really big challenge. Some people said, well, if you put a little on the side so that people don't empty them out and, and uh, you know, sell them at used bookstores, um, if you have any tips, I know that that's always an ongoing topic in the library library stewards page. Um, any advice? Sometimes people say, well, you know, there are free books and that's really true. Um, but, you know, any advice that you have, because I know people get really concerned and they, they want to, they want to share, but they want to also know that books, sometimes they set aside certain books for people who come to regulate kids and teenagers. So I'm sorry, I'm talking on. Um, if you have any advice for for stewards there stickers anyway. over the upc labels so okay. we have five locations that are downtown and they used to get just emptied just like someone would just come and literally take all the books and when we started putting stickers over the upc labels they stopped. And the other thing you can do, and I'll show you. So this is the book I'm reading now. You can literally just draw a line like that, and then they won't be able Thank to scan you. it anymore. And what they do, there's actually an app, and I, I think it's the coolest thing. So basically, you hold the book up, and you scan the UPC, and it tells you everywhere that you can sell the book, and like it like lets you post really fast. So if you scan cross out the UPC or put a sticker over it, that right there just eliminates their ability to do that. And then they're not motivated to type in the titles to continue looking. So if you actually do have resellers, that would be the way to combat that. Um, there are some, sometimes you get people who just don't know that it's polite to leave some books. Um, so those just keep filling, just keep filling, just keep filling, and eventually they'll start bringing stuff back. And you may talk to other, you know, like you have a relationship with a local bookstore to have them be on a, a lookout for those little free libraries. I, I also, it's very true that, you know, we don't know why somebody empties out and they may be helping a large community who is in, in need of all of those books. And so um, we can be mindful of that as well. You know, we've got, um, we've got a real need for books and um, for reading materials. So uh, we can, we're, we're just part of a bigger community. So uh, I think we can kind of try to balance as much as we can. Um, but there are, there are ways to do it because we, we do know that some people really take through. Anybody else? Okay. Um, and go ahead. Hen. 
Oh, I was just going to say, I know in our area, when we first started, because we serve as a Title I school, there were families who, A, may not have known kind of the take a book, leave a right. book concept. And also right. because they did, may not have had books at home, they felt like they wanted to take as many as they could. And we just kept filling. And when I think yeah. when they realized that the box was going to stay full, then they didn't feel compelled to take everything because they knew that when they came back, there would still be some and it slowed them down a little. And they just, they didn't have that sense of um, desperation to need and and take the books. Um, The other thing I would mention is that if you can build up a big backstock, it really helps so that you don't have that stress of feeling like, Oh my gosh, I only have one box of books available. And so if someone clears me out, I'm going to be out of backstock. Um, People are so generous. And especially during COVID, people were cleaning their bookshelves and cleaning out their garages and their attics. And I really think that if you um, take some time to build up your backstock, then you don't have that stress if you're, if you come out and your library is empty. I think that's that's a really, really good point. Um, on, on finding books, I, I also wanted to add, I used to, when I lived in D.C., um, the neighborhood thrift store, I always looked for um, bilingual children's books or books in Spanish. That was always a great way because we were right in a high-needs community, and it was a great way to pass on um, books. And also that the build the Little Free Library structure, uh, there, was a, there were some, like, refugee uh, or... Um, immigrant community organizations, they couldn't have a physical structure in front of their building because, of course, it's a community and they have laws, but they could put a little book kept shelf inside their little, little, little uh, space in their lobby space. And so there are, you know, kind of ways to make an adjustment, just be in contact with them and find different ways that you can help them um, serve their community. Um, the eagerness to, to do that is great. Um, so thank you. Um, Shelby and Lexi, are we, I'm, am I still on? Oh, we're going to do your, what is, what is your why? Okay, this is a great question. It was a really interesting question for each and every one of you. Why are you doing it? Why do you keep going in the, in the toughest days? Which is, what is the why that you turn to uh, in trying to help? So I'm going to go in the order that I see you all on my screen. So Yenny, I'll start with you. You're at the top of my screen. <laughs> What's your why? Oops. Oh, my bad. I was on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my God, my ear <laughs> <bones. laughs> My bad. Uh, a couple of my experiences stood out as my biggest why, um, you know, uh, starting even the WIPO Unity and becoming uh, LFL steward. Uh, again, I came to the U.S. as a beginner in you know, English learners. I just never really saw uh, much representations. Uh, and years later, even as a mom to an Asian American child living in a suburb of Atlanta, I also never saw books that my child can relate to. Uh, and again, um, I also have, uh, you know, years of uh, experience as a volunteer, uh, as a volunteer, um, as a reading tutor volunteer for element, elementary students um, in my neighborhood at that time, which is South Atlanta, predominantly African-American neighborhood. Uh, again, no representation. And what I think what really strikes me the most is actually a couple of even a couple of decades later, later, these statistics have not changed. I don't know if you know, but like, you know, only 12% of children's books today uh, featured, you know, um, African-American characters, 9% Asian-American, 6% Latinx, mm-hmm. and 1% Native Nation, and even less of uh, Pacific Islander. So uh, that is primarily our why. Uh, my ambitious goal is to Diver- diversify every household and uh, classroom and neighborhood bookshelves all over America. Good for you, Yanni. And Kristen, your, your why? Um, so I've always loved reading. I got my first public library card when I was in preschool. I volunteered in our school's bookmobile starting in third grade. So I've just always had a passion for that. I went on to become a reporter for my high school newspaper, my college newspaper. I went on to become um, a reporter and editor for newspapers throughout Southern California. So I have that 
writing background. I have the reading background. And when I had kids, I think that was the turning point. Every parent probably takes this time to read out loud to their kids. And I, of course, I did that when our girls were little, um, but I never really stopped. So as I mentioned, my uh, younger daughter is a junior in high school. My older daughter is a sophomore in college, and we still read books out loud um, to our girls. So we read the entire Harry Potter series. I tried reading it in an English accent. They told me eventually, Mom, you've got to stop. <laughs> um, we've read the Divergent series. We've read the Hobbit series. Um, I always wanted to shadow read anything that they were reading for school. Um, it was something that I grew up doing with my mom. My mom and I still shadow read each other's books. And so those girls are really my, my why. And knowing that these books are going to other children, um, we just finished a book drive um, where we, we got 625 um, children's books in English and in Spanish. Most of them are new or near new, and we're going to be placing them in book deserts throughout Southern California between Los Angeles and the U.S.-Mexico border. And the thought of children finding those books, um, that's my why. Thank you, Kristen. I love this. Christine. And for those of you who are tuning in, I just want to put your why in the chat. We'll love to hear what your reasons are. But Christine, it, the floor is yours. So I have some of the same roots as Kristen. I used to love going to our library, and I used to always be one of the library helpers, and uh, I'd go at lunchtime. It was very much my safe space. So I was actually bullied as a child, and books and reading have always been my safe and happy space. And so for me to get to share that with people um, and at this scale, I mentioned we've brought over 100,000 books and actually we've brought an additional six or 7,000 now that are brand new untouched thanks to Publishers First Book. Uh, they're diverse, they're windows and mirrors, and it's just such a privilege to be able to do that. And I really want to make sure that everybody has the ability to read, to share, uh, to take books, to leave books. And I think the thing that people miss is that it's a gift to be able to share. It is such a gift to be able to say, here, I have extra. Why don't you take some? And the way that you can do that with books, because like when you read it, you're going to pass it on. So it's such an easy thing to just take a book, read it, and put it back in a little free library. And you didn't have to have anything. You didn't have to come with anything. Like, here, just take the book, enjoy it, exactly. and pass it on when you're done. Thank you. And Lisa, how about, how about you? Um, well, for me, it's it's a, it was a personal journey growing up across the border in Ciudad Juarez. Um, there were just no libraries. So um, there are libraries now. But when I was growing up in the 80s, um, libraries were just not a thing across the border. There were bookstores, what we call librerias. So mm -hmm. you have to have money and go to a private bookstores to buy books. So I had books, but unfortunately, when I was in first grade, second grade, it was determined that I have dyslexia. So um, reading did not become a passion in my life until my freshman year in college when I discovered uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's books. And I just started devouring his books. Um, Sherlock Holmes, to this day, I love uh, mysteries. And so I, as a librarian now, I, have, I received my master's in library science by, by the time I was 30. And I always tell students, I say, you know, we, to me, I feel like we're really pushing students. You have to be reading by the time you're seven or eight years old. But the reality is, is that it takes some of us longer. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. You just need to find that one special book that you connect right. with at whatever age you're at. And so I, I feel like students just see the light when I share my yeah. story. They're like, oh, okay, so if there's learning disabilities, if there's any diagnoses, it's okay. 
my hope is that by supplying and having a variety and a plethora of different books, uh, especially with representation, when they see themselves in books, my hopes is that they will one day become an avid reader, as I became later on. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. And for mine, it was, you know, I'm very much mirrored the rest of you. My mother, my parents are from a very tiny island in the Philippines. My mother had to take care of um, family members when she had to leave elementary school. She couldn't go back. And but my both my parents, when they came to the U.S., they pointed to books and they said, all of your answers are here. And, uh, you know, everything I do from being in a bookmobile and doing library to read across America to Little Free Library has been in tribute to them. I just want to thank all of you. Thanks to our wonderful guests and all of you on tuning in. Little Free Library stewards are the backbone of our network, our family, the depth, breadth and depth. You know, we just never could have gotten to 100, almost 150,000 libraries without your support, your dedication, your, you know, your creativity. And, you know, there are so many of you worldwide. And so I just want to thank all of you. I, you know, you're my family. So, and I love every single one of you. And I hope to see you in person one of these days. So thank you all so, so much. And we'll continue to support you. Um, so if you have enjoyed this chapter of Little Free Library Unbound, please, please consider um, donating because that is where we do our impact libraries, our native impact libraries. It's where we support and do the work that we do, read in color. It, they also support our steward services, the things that we do, like Little Free Library Unbound and, and help create more resources and opportunities. And you can donate at littlefreelibrary.org slash donate. Um, do a fundraiser, um, do whatever you can. We just love every single one of you and join us, you know, be part of our family. Thank you. All right, Lexi and Shelby, take it away. And I'll see you guys next time. Thank you, Anita. And thank you to our steward panelists. As always, there is just a wealth of knowledge and experiences to share that I think is so valuable to other stewards, to patrons, to us as a little free library organization. There's always something new to learn, a new perspective to consider. And this is always such a valuable experience for me as someone who works with stewards every day. So thank you so much for sharing your experience. I myself have um, my first little free library sitting on my porch, ready to be installed soon um, after I get home from vacation. So I'm really excited to join your ranks as a steward myself. As always, attendees will receive an email in the next couple of days with a link to the replay. So you can check this out again, share it with other folks who might be interested in this content. Um, you'll have the show notes and a survey. And as Anita mentioned at the beginning, in honor of Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month, we'll be giving away five copies of Dreamers by Yuli Morales. And I'm really excited um, that has been highly recommended. It's one of our Reading Color recommended titles and um, it is features real life books, which is really, really cool. Um, and next month we're doing something a little different for Unbound. In October, we are celebrating one whole year of our Reading Color program. Um, it's our Diverse Books Initiative. You can learn more about that on our website as well. And we are hosting a trivia event with all of our partners and friends. We are sharing the highlights of the last year of the Reading Color program and enjoying a fun, great, fun game of book-related trivia. So keep an eye out on your email for an invitation to that event. Space will be limited, so be sure to get a team together um, and sign up right away. Shelby has some more information. She's got a link um, for more information about upcoming chapters of Unbound. And you can also check out all of our replays of previous chapters of Unbound if you're interested. Um, in particular, you might be interested in our April episode, which was our first um, steward panel. And we addressed the issue of having your library cleared out. There's some really insightful, thoughtful um, commentary from our stewards in that session that will be um, of interest to you if you didn't see that yet. Finally, if you haven't already, we encourage you to follow us on social media. We have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and you can stay in the know on what's going on with Little Free Library, our Reading Color program, Unbound, and our plans for that. And Shelby has shared all those links in the chat. Um, as I mentioned, next 
month will be a little bit different. So we will hopefully see you at our trivia event. And if not, we will be back with your regular Unbound programming in November. Thank you again for being here with us today. Have a good night.